So thanks again for coming in, really. No, oh, my pleasure. It means a lot. I'm glad that I was able to come. Me too. I, I want to talk about your new album, uh, La Papessa, in a minute. But first, I want to go back to Colombia. You were 11 years old when you sang in your first band, is that right? Yeah. What, what kind of music was it? Metal. Metal? Yeah. Like what? Like power metal, like heavily influenced by Creative of Filth mm-hmm. and um, Fear Factory. Yeah. That vibe. But with like a hint, I'm not going to lie, I will, especially with all the, your, um, the teenage lists, I was listening to Corn, Limp Bizkit, all those things too. You know, I'm not going to lie. But uh, I don't know, I was just interested in the whole movement, so that's what I did at 11, because I was precocious. I remember like those lists on, on Facebook right now and yeah. things. Yeah, I, I feel the same way, is that like, I feel like we're getting a nice, I don't mind, I love reading them. Mm-hmm. Like, I love, love reading what people were listening to in mm-hmm. high school, but I agree. I think we're leaving out the corn and the Limp yeah. Bizkit. Don't curate it. Yeah. Just say it. I, I actually said my top 10, mm-hmm. and uh, corn wasn't, in there, but uh, Tragic Kingdom by No Doubt for sure was in there. I think that was my guilty pleasure because I just, I'm just, I don't really like what Gwen's doing right now. I love, um, I heard Sunday Morning the other day and, I, and I lost my mind. I think it's an incredible song. It's amazing. The song actually, Tragic Kingdom. Oh yeah. It's my favorite song of the entire album and it wasn't as popular as uh, the other whatever singles, but to me, Tragic Kingdom is a masterpiece. I love, uh, but I like Corn too. The other, like three weeks ago, I listened yeah. to Freak on a Leash. Yeah. And it's just as good as I remember it being. Well, the two first albums too, they were amazing. What were, what were you getting out of music back then? Um, it was um, freedom. It was my voice. It was my, my escape, you know? Like I went to uh, uh, English school and it was called Lyndon B. Johnson. And, oh, named after an American president. Yeah, yeah. and uh, you, it, you would get like uh, low marks if they caught you speaking Spanish. And, uh, you know, even being in Colombia, living in Colombia, you have to really be sure and love your identity. So, yeah, music just gave me a space where I was embraced for being myself. And then in 2005, you and your family, after living in Colombia, after being from Colombia, making art in Colombia, you're, you're forced to leave the country. Yeah. What, what happened? Um, well, it's no uh, secret that <laughs> there's a political turmoil in Colombia, right? And uh, we were just one of the pawns. And uh, long story short, um, my mom decided to bring the family to a safer place because of some threats and menaced perhaps one of our family members would be kidnapped so we went to well my mother and my uh, older sibling they went to LA Mm -hmm. but my mom didn't like it she thought that it was too fast and too furious (laughs) so she decided thanks mom to go to London Ontario Canada yeah that's a big change (laughs) yeah hold on I want to get to that change in a second how old were you in this when you had to leave um, well, actually, my mother left when I was about to turn 15, mm-hmm. and I lived um, with relatives up until I was uh, 19. So for that's when immigration started for me, when my mother left. I so was you, still living in the country. So you were old enough to get it. It wasn't like a, why, yeah. why, why the hell am I leaving? No, I totally knew, and uh, I always, I was, t- I told this the other day to um, Naomi Klein, how she, um was one of the reasons why my mom decided to take me to London. What do you mean? Because I was uh, reading Naomi Klein when I was uh, 11, 12, 13, and my mom was uh, really worried that I was going to be like an activist. And uh, She didn't want that for you? She didn't. Well, because I was becoming one. Like I said, I was a very precocious, curious child, and I had a lot of freedom that comes when your parent, you know, my mom was a single mom. My dad died when I was six. He had died of cancer. And uh, I was, uh, my mom was at work and she took care of three kids by herself. So I had a lot of time by myself at the house. So I was getting my information from, you know, news and MTV, but also books. Mm -hmm. And my people in my band, they were 10 years older than me. So I would just read whatever they were reading. So I was interested in politics very early on. And I'm also indigenous. So you see the difference when you go from the desert to the city 
and how the jokes that people make around you, not really knowing that you are what they're making fun of. So, of course, yeah, I became very political very early on. And, uh, yeah, my mom, she decided that coming to London, Ontario, Canada <laughs> was, was best. It was, you know, quite quiet. And uh, yeah. I would tell her, come to Toronto, let's go to Toronto. And, like, <laughs> no, too fast. You, you, get out, you get out of the plane or you, you get out of the car. You're, you're living in London. It's such a, a – I'm, I'm guessing a big difference. And where you, where you were living before. Yeah, yeah. What, what, were your, what were your initial feelings about living in, in either London or Ontario or in Canada? <laughs> well, it's cold. <laughs> that was it, because I came in November and it was actually a huge snowstorm. We were driving through a uh, yeah, pretty massive uh, snowstorm and uh, I remember just seeing everything. It was very dark and covered in uh, snow and... Uh, at the same time, I wasn't really preoccupied with that. I was more excited to be able to be in my mother's embrace after five years of not being together, of only being able to talk, you know, on the phone or messenger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, I was just really excited because to me, Canada was, before moving here, Chile Gonzalez and... Um, Peaches. Yeah. And, so you got uh, some Canadian music. You knew some yes, Canadian music. Yes. Yeah. And uh, that was my reference. Is like, whoa, their music is amazing. I'm going to have such a good time. Yeah. And also, you know, Canada has amazing PR. I've always said it. And uh, What do you mean? Uh, pff, Canada is the best country in the world. Didn't you know? That's the PR? Yeah. That's what, that's what you're hearing? Yeah. Okay. Um, we need skilled workers, and uh, there's a lot of old people that are dying, so young people should go. That's what you hear right. about Canada. That's what people know. Also, it's amazing. They get along with French people so well, and everyone is bilingual. So actually, I went, and I went to the, the French Alliance and then <laughs> to, to learn French. Mm -hmm. So I go my first day of school, and I'm like, oh, so great. We can all practice French. And everyone was like, why? <laughs> oh yeah, you start you started to see the cracks in the PR. Yeah, then I was the, yeah. like, mm, this is not quite. <laughs> well, it was so, fine. Someone's not giving me a loony every day yeah. when I'm walking down the street. No, no. So, so you come in 2005. <laughs> you release your first record, Color, in 2010. Mm -hmm. It gets you this critical praise, this healthy buzz. That's when I first heard, uh, heard of you. Mm. Take take me back to to that first record. Where were you in your life when you made that album? I had just given birth. Um... So you have a, a seven-year-old. Um, well, I had him when I was 21, mm -hmm. so 20, 2008. But I was still in that mom, mother. I was. I mean, I breastfed until he was like four and a half, mm -hmm. um, which everyone should do. Okay. If you can, you should do it. Breastfeeding the best. And uh, I, uh, I was just, you know, I didn't really have any, uh, there was no agenda. My agenda was I am going to put the songs on MySpace so that my friends back in Colombia can hear it. Okay. And then uh, this, like, huge Mexican star heard it. And then because she retweeted it, then it became this big thing. And But I wasn't really thinking about anything. I was just simply excited that I was able to share my songs because they were in Spanish. And uh, that's another, that's a shock, you know. If there was any shock to me, was uh, not being able to to express myself in my own language, and uh, to be able to have people who cannot even understand what I'm saying um, want to book me for shows, and that was very exciting. So that's where I was at the time. I was just, you know, I lived with my ex, and uh, mm -hmm. we and had you, our little life in yeah, London. You, you yeah. said that was like a tenuous time in your life. Yeah, it was. Um, it started fine, but then, you know, when you're young, you don't really know what you're doing. And I think that we were just so young, and then we broke up, you know. We, we, it was it. It was done, and I had to move on. And things got interesting, actually, when I moved to Toronto, mm -hmm. you know, after that. And for the album, you know, to me, the significance of that first album, it was such a roller coaster because it taught me what the music industry is about and that you need people to protect you because people will take advantage of you. Yeah. So, I mean, I was one of the millions of people that this has probably happened to, but I was just so grateful 
that someone would want to book me and take me play in the States or play in Europe. But there was never talk about money. There was never talk about artist fees. There was never talk about where am I going to stay, who's going to take care of me. Yeah. I did these tours and, uh, yeah, some bookers and promoters and labels. You know, that whole thing, that was what really made me take some steps back. So when I started writing the next album, I didn't even have an agenda either. I was just, I want to go to school and I want to become an art critic and curator and I want to learn more about who I am and I want to really understand, you know, what being Canadian, what is that? And uh, understanding always that I exist in the construct of the Canadian landscape. So that's pretty much what I did, you know. Hard, hard times, they come every year. You just have to just keep keep going. To, to com- compare those two records for me. Like when you look at Color, that first record, and now the the new one, La Papessa, h- how do you see the differences between those two? So the first album was this collaborative love project between me and um, my ex-husband. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's a wonderful musician. It's Michael, uh, Michael, Michael Ramey, Ramey yeah. yeah. From his uh, Golden Death Music. He's based in Columbus, Ohio. And, um, you know, I had I wrote all these songs and I brought them with me from Colombia and then I was showing them to him and then he was like, you know what, I'll produce them. Perfect. And I was learning how to get into producing because up until that point, I was a performer, right? Me being a recording artist happened way after I've learned how to become an artist and a performer, which I think was really lucky for me because now... When I perform, I am so in control that it was nice to, afterwards, with La Papesa, understand really what it was to produce, to be a producer, to have um, control, artistic control, and really have my my voice in every aspect, whether I collaborate or not. So when I decided to move, you know, I moved with my kid, couple milk crates, couple portfolios with my artwork. This is to Toronto? Yeah. yeah. And that's when the album started taking shape. Mm-hmm. So 2012, 20, end of 2012, I moved to start school. But school was at the bottom of my list. I was like... Yeah, you were making music. You I'm were, just, yeah, a, yeah, you know, yeah. I, was, I want to make my album. And uh, I uh, was lucky that I found amazing people that I could do that with mm-hmm. that are still with me now. So it was a... Learning experience. So album number one is this freedom of just expressing myself. And then La Papesa was a school of actually being myself. Tell me a little bit about the title, La Papesa. So La Papesa is um, a high priestess in the tarot. Um, Tarot. Yeah, Yeah. the tarot card. Um, And it's... um, I'm no tarot expert. Sure. I wish I would have brought no. one of my hippie friends that would tell you. You don't, you don't have to give yeah. the, you don't, you but, don't have to go to the historical. Yeah, like, but that's well, a high priestess in the tarot. And um, What does that mean to you? It means to me what the card means to a lot of people, which is, you know, to concentrate and focus and um, have knowledge on your lap and not let anything distract you from your goals. And um, the beginning of the album really... Um, is me letting go of my past and embracing my future. So that's what La Papesa is. And I needed to get in the high priestess mode so that I could really hone into my talent, so that I could really be the strong woman that I am. So then that's how I see myself. I see myself as a as a strong entity that is full of love, but is also full of strength and survival. And what I have to say should be heard. And that's what the album is. So let's take a listen to some music from it. Uh, this is from uh, Lido Pimienta's new album, La Papesa. This is called uh, La Capacidad. Uh, what can you tell me about it? So La Capacidad is a song that I wrote after um, an abusive relationship that I uh, survived. And um, yeah, it's a song about letting the other person know that love shouldn't be a life sentence. Tú, tú tienes la capacidad. 
It really is. If you're just tuning in, uh, this is Q. I'm Tom Power. That's a bit of a song called La Capacidad. It's off the latest album from my guest today, Lido Pimienta. You said before we played the song that this is such a, a personal song to you. You're, you're in this abusive relationship. It's funny, you know, when you release songs, you actually release them. Yeah. Like you, you, you let them go from you. It's not just a, it's not just a word. Absolutely. And you said that that song, once you released it, uh, has taken on a whole other meaning. Yeah. Which I find so fascinating that a song can be written about something specific in your life and can mean something so different to someone else. Mm-hmm. Can, can you explain that to me? Well, because most of the shows that I do happen in uh, either the States or Canada, I have mastered the way to communicate without translating. So with this song in particular... It has become an anthem for other women, and it has become an anthem for other women of color, and it has become an anthem for um, other indigenous women. When I performed this song live, at the end, I close with the question of, you know, what did this happen to me? And uh, because it is a question that many women ask themselves when they're victims of um, domestic abuse. And this is what has happened to this song. Um, People understand the significance of a woman speaking up because when you've been abused, there is a shame that comes with it and uh, a vulnerability that not a lot of people are or feel allowed to to feel. So with this song, um, I've been able to do that and Again, without an agenda, without any, I just, you know, release, like you were saying. And um, I am really proud of the song, not only because of the message, but because of, of out of all the songs in the album, it was truly a collaboration between myself and my co-producers, Blake McFarlane, Kavesh Bijons, and um, the percussion, live percussion from Brandon Valdivia, all amazing, amazing people in the city that have been making wonderful sounds. So there are three straight men, right? It's just straight guys that they see me as their leader. So it was a, another healing process of producing this song with men that know when to shut up when I'm talking and that just let me do my thing and trust me so I feel very blessed that, you know, it started as a very painful process to put the pain into words. But when we perform it, it's a celebration because people are celebrating with us. But how does that, how does that feel when you, when you write this, this song that came from pain? What, what is the emotion that you feel when someone comes up to you afterwards and says, you know, that, that, that means something completely different to me, but it's, it, it, I carry it in my life? The main thing that people say, you know, um, I didn't know what you were saying, but you had me in tears the entire time. And then I tell them what what it's about, or I'll do a small premise on stage. Just kind of a, here's what... Yeah. yeah. I'll just tell them the story, you know. Yeah. And, um, And people are grateful, and we just embrace, and on to the next show, on to the next... Mission. Let's listen to uh, on to the next song. This is QQTVB. It's the title of another song on the album. Let's let's give it a listen.
next bit of music from Colombian Canadian artist Lido Pimienta. She has a new album out called La Papisa. QQTVB? Yeah. <laughs> is, that, is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's an acronym. Yes. Uh, what, what, what for? Quiero que te vaya bien, which means I want you to do well. And this is a song about someone you were with, someone, someone you cared about. Baby daddy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? <laughs> Let's just say what say what it is. Sure, you know sure. what I'm saying? What, what part of your story is this song telling? It's um, when you accept that you break up for the better. Yeah. And that in your rage and in your anger and all the emotions that go with breakup, when you realize that this was the best that could have happened for us as people, us as parents, um, you want the other person to be well. You know? A lot of people, though, and I know you know them, <laughs> and I know them, who have who have breakups. Hmm. They they never get over them, yeah. and they can just be you know d- disagreements, and they can be you mm. know uh, relatively you know say peaceful breakups. Yeah, but they carry it with them for the rest of their lives. Yeah, how do you how do you, how do you think you got to where you are? Um, if I didn't have art. <laughs> really? You think that might have saved you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean? If I didn't have a way to um, put my sorrows in the, a painting or a textile piece or a song, you know. If I didn't have the amazing sisterhood that I have in the city, I don't know what would have happened, you know. And I feel like people that are unable to let go, it's because they actually don't have that. I'm also very tight with my mom, very tight with my sister. So, yeah. You think th- this is what helped you? Yeah. I found security. I found healing in my artwork and in the people that love me. So when you realize how much love you actually have, one less person is not such a big deal. And then you, in wishing the other person well, you also heal. So... Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. You're right. I mean, mm-hmm. the part of part of healing is 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 forgiveness. Yeah. How's your kid? Amazing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You enjoy being a mom. It is the best thing in the world, and I cannot wait to um, be a mother again. What do you mean? I cannot wait to do it again. I cannot wait to oh, get, another, have another baby. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, you, mm-hmm. you, you love it. I I love it. I would have four kids if I could. <laughs> I would adopt when I'm rich and famous. Yeah. What do you love yeah, about gonna it? You're going to come back. I'm going to have my 20 kids here, adopted, foster kids, all that. I love it. I love it. As soon as this interview's over. Yeah. This is when, this is when it happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> I have the man. I just yeah. have to convince him a little bit more. <laughs> I know. It seems like a dumb question. Like, and it's, it's a question that me as a total, uh, not a total non-parent, but as a non-parent would ask. Like, <laughs> what, what, what do you love about it? What do you get out of it? Um, it is just, it just, okay. It is very hard, number one, being a parent. You are worried all the time and you don't really sleep. But it is the most rewarding, best feeling when you just have this person that loves you so much. I don't really know how to express it. I just, I just, it's just. Has it changed you as an artist? It, it, it has made me um, a more organized person. Um, this is something, you know, being a parent is not my identity. You know, I am an artist that happens to be a parent, but I'm not. It doesn't really shape who I am. What it, what it has helped me is into becoming a better manager of my business. It, it, it really... It, it makes you realize who your friends are. It, um, it, it allows you to have very clear priorities and goals. So that's what uh, parenthood uh, means to me. You know, it's like you really have to get it together. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and it's just for the better, you know. Um, I love it. My, and it's the best. How about some more music? Let's do it. Yeah. This is, uh, this is the song Al Unisono Viajan. Um, tell me a little bit about it. So al unisono viajan uh, means they fly away in unison. And um, this is a song about the similar narrative of colonization in the North um, and South of America. So it is my love song for 
my my brothers and sisters up here that are indigenous. Take a listen. Mm-hmm. How you were nodding your head there. You were doing like half, half time. Yeah. One, two. I wasn't, I wasn't counting it the same way. <laughs> That's the sounds of Lido Pimienta. The song is called Alunisono Viajan. It's off our latest album, La Pepeso. Mm-hmm. Um, how, how familiar were you with uh, Canada's indigenous politics before you came here? Zero, nada, yeah. non, nada, nothing. Nothing at all. When I saw, <laughs> when I saw the first uh, native familiar face, I, I just couldn't believe it. What do you mean? Because, again, Canada's PR, well, I, I, I didn't say the whole thing. Um, the picture of Canada is a, is, a, is a snow hill, a deer, and a white man with a ski, with ski attire, dashing blue eyes. Yes. Hmm. <laughs> and luscious blonde hair, right? right? Yeah. So that's it. You just don't even I think you think... just described Brian Adams, by the way. <laughs> I think that's just Brian Adams. I think you just saw a picture of him. Shout out to Brian Adams. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so you just have no idea that we have been touched by the same pain, right? And um, I think about it often, too, with, um, with the refugee crisis, for instance, and... Um, it is so beautiful that we are able, as a nation, to bring people in need, specifically because their life depends on it. And I and I ask, you know, myself, like, okay, are they? Is this what's going to happen to them? The shock of understanding, you know, the the real history of Canada, right? So, yeah, that's what what I what I feel like expressing all the time because it is so important in order for us as a country to move forward as immigrants, as settlers, as newcomers, whatever, to know what what went on and what keeps going on. It is the only way to make sure that, you know, we're going to make it right. So that's what that song is about. That's what I'm about. And as a parent, that's what I am about because I want my child to have empathy, compassion. And I don't want him to be oblivious and I don't want my kid to think that Canada is the perfect, most amazing, most wonderful, benevolent country in the world when it's not, when, when such a thing doesn't even exist. So It's funny you mentioned yeah. the, 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 the real history of Canada. We had um, a tribe called Red in, into the studio not too long ago, and that was that was a large part of our discussion. It was coming up on Canada 150. Well, what's 150? Why not mm. go back further? And, and yeah. what is the real history of this country? I know that you collaborated with a tribe called Red. Mm-hmm. Um, do you see any common threads between what Indigenous artists are doing in Colombia and what Indigenous artists are doing in Canada? The thread has been. Uh, th- yeah, like the thread. Do you see any? The thread no? has been happening for years now. We're just catching on. Um, I mean, if you see countries like Bolivia, Peru, what old ladies, indigenous women are doing, taking down entire corporations with a bucket of water at a time, that's the thread. I mean, that's what I see. And uh, it's just exciting to me to see what Tanya Tagak is doing, what tribe are doing, and I cannot wait for the next generation also that have access to to communication, that have access to the internet, that have access to the real history and uh, being proud of who they, who they are, you know. I see it too, the, my generation of indigenous youth, right? Like in my people, my cousins, they don't like to speak our native language, but the kids that are my son's age, they're so proud 
because there is a shift that is happening. And uh, I mean, we are really talking and centering like the alt-right, white supremacy, whatever thing. But as that is rising, indigenous identity and uh, self-love is also rising. So I just love what they're doing. I mean, I'm just so thrilled like that we get able to we're able to collaborate. Like I see them as friends, and uh, this is only getting better. You know, and you identify as both indigenous and as black. Yeah, your, your mother is is why you. Yeah, uh, people indigenous to Colombia. Your mm-hmm. father was Afro Colombian. Mm-hmm. Um, how do those two cultural identities impact or or form the sounds we hear on this new record? It is in me. You yeah. know. Yeah, I know it, what you mean. It's. It just it just happens. It just. It's just in me. It's just the voice. I've been blessed with this voice that is a is a complete mix of repetitive chanting and swag it it is you know so i don't know i just feel like i'm the best kind of mix and i embrace both of the things that i am and all of the things that i am and that i continue to be so this brings me to a question that i think we've been hovering around mm the entire interview, and uh, you've brought it up a couple of times, and I wanted to, to push it away because I wanted to, to dedicate a little bit of time to it. And you said earlier, I, I don't translate my music. Mm. Uh, I want to I speak and I want to sing in my language. Mm. Um, when I get up on stage and I sing for people, uh, they, they create a great empathy for me and I create great empathy for them, even though quite often they don't understand exactly mm. what it is that I'm saying. Um, you've been very always open about the importance of singing in Spanish and not singing in English. What went into that decision? Well, number one, even if I try with my own music, it doesn't really come out in English. It's just not as honest. It just it doesn't really sound as good. Um, I can write English songs for other people, which I do mm-hmm. quite a bit. I write for a bunch of producers in the States, in Europe, um, I'm constantly writing music for other people. I can do that. I can write a mean English bubblegum pop song. Yeah. Yes, I can. But not for me. Um, and maybe in 10 years. I don't know. But you've been, <laughs> but you've been adamant not just that like you don't do it, but that yeah. you, you kind of won't do it. Yeah. I, I just don't. It, there's no need. Um, Spanish is one of the most spoken languages in the world. And uh, when I was learning English and I was like listening to, you know, Portis Head and um, Tricky and all the things, uh, I went out and I found the lyrics and I was like trying to understand what they were saying and translate it word by word until I knew it. And perhaps that's why I speak English the way that I speak. Like, you know, like I barely have an accent. Um, it's because of that, because I force myself to learn. When Beyonce goes to South America, you know, everyone is singing in English. Mm-hmm. People don't quite know how to speak it. Maybe half of the people know actually how to speak it properly, but you go out of your way to understand something that you love. That's as simple as that. And I feel like people need to get to the you know, get with the program and get on with some Spanish lessons or something and you will love it because you will discover this beautiful music that should be shared. You close off the album with a song called Quiero Jardines. Hmm. Um, why did you pick this track to end the record? Because after all the punches of life, there is hope. And um, what, what does the song what does the song translate to? What does the song mean? It means I want gardens. I understand the irony of you mm-hmm. saying that, and then me asking you to translate that for me. By the yeah. way, <laughs> I feel I feel it too. <laughs> it's good though. There's so many people hearing this that are just getting to know me. So T- tell me, tell me yeah. again, uh, tell me about this song before we hear it. So this song is about finding yourself and your dreams and your goals in another person, whether they're your friends or your lover or whoever it is, and um, finding community and finding a person that is by your side that you can make each other's dreams come true. When I do this on live, I tell people to focus on the word quiero because quiero means I want. So we all sing quiero together. And I tell them, you know, think about that thing that you want. And let's say it, let's speak it, let's proclaim it. And uh, 
I'm sure it's going to happen because you have to take action and you have to go for what you want. And this song is about that. It's a celebration of life. It's a celebration of your voice. It's a celebration of us being alive. And uh, for me particularly, um, the reason why this album took six years to see the light was because uh, my brother's passing on. My, my little brother, he left our world and uh, I needed to really take a break and I took uh, my time and I was enjoying myself. I was with my child and with my family and in their embrace, I found that garden, right? I was able to find the garden and each member of my family and my chosen family, you, you plant your seeds. And when your friendship and your relationship grows, your love is the water that makes all of us have our fruits. And this is what this song is about. Un jardín comienza con una semilla y una visión alimentada con la luz del sol. Sigue así, sigue así, amor mío, sigue así. Llega todo alrededor, tus sueños viven en mi cuerpo. Vida aquí, vida aquí, nada es justo. Hay vida aquí, te regalo el resplandor. Amanece y el desierto. Quiero ir, quiero ir detrás tuyo. Quiero ir, comenzar la humanidad de otro planeta y universo. Corazón de paz. Beautiful. That was a bit of Kiera Jardines, the closing song from the latest album from singer Lilo Pimienta, who's been my uh, guest in the Q studio today. Um, it's been so great to talk to you. Thank uh, you. Before, before I let you go, you know, you've touched on so many personal things about this album. Yeah. You've talked about your brother. You've talked about motherhood. Yeah. You've talked about moving. You've talked about changing. You've talked about holding on to something. Mm. All very, very personal things to you. Mm-hmm. I have no doubt that when you listen listen to this interview today, you or at least some of you are going to are going to seek out this record and I, I don't blame you for doing it. It's a beautiful <laughs> thing. However, these are all things about you. And we talked about individual songs this way, but I'm wondering if someone gets this record today and listens to it, what, what do you want them to take away from it? I want them to take away that a woman's voice should never be taken for granted. That's it. Lido Pimienta, it's been a joy to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you.